Greetings and salutations. Thanks for hanging out with me for a while. In this video, we're going to take a look at Ubuntu 1910. This is the official main line release of Ubuntu, not a flavor. This is the one that comes with canonical spin on the GNOME desktop. Last time around, we took a look at Ubuntu Mate 1910, which comes with the Mate desktop. And I can tell you that it turned out to be very stable. I ran it for about a week and it was a lot of fun. So if you want to go ahead and install the beta for Ubuntu 19.10, I can tell you that it pretty much worked okay on my machine with a couple of caveats, which we actually covered in that video, and I will cover again in this one. Now, if you're thinking, I saw the last video, and I don't need to watch this one because the only thing that's changed is the desktop. No, there's some big changes we need to talk about. Some things have come to light, let's put it that way, since I posted that last video. Let's go ahead and put it out there. This is not an official review or a guide of any kind. We're just taking a quick look around. I'm going to miss stuff. I'm going to get stuff wrong. I'm going to make mistakes. This is a beta release. I have only had it running in a virtual machine since yesterday. So that's what we're getting. That's what we're going to talk about here. We're looking at the OMG Ubuntu article about Ubuntu 1910. And you can click on this and look at it for yourself. So I'm not going to get into too much detail. But there were a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. I'm going to put a link in the description for this particular article. I'm not really sure what you're going to get if you click on this after the official release date, but the link will be there and you can give it a try. I'm thinking a lot of folks are going to be watching this before the official release date, which is coming up on the 17th. I'm recording this on the 8th of October, and I hopefully will get it posted the same day. So we're just under two weeks away. So this is the Ewan Ehrman. That's the code name. I did not cover that when we talked about Ubuntu Mate 1910. Eowyn refers to of the dawn. It's what that means. It's about the dawn or of the dawn. And Ermin, that's that little bitty animal right there. Isn't he cute? When I was a kid, I used to hear all the time about ladies getting ermine coats back when fur coats were still popular in the mid-20th century. So they were taking these little guys and making coats out of them. That is so sad. I've heard some people struggle with the pronunciation of that. Some people are calling it ermine. I don't know whether that's proper or not. I do know that in all the old movies and TV shows I saw when I was a kid, when some lady was talking about getting a coat, she got an ermine coat. So that's how I pronounce it. You can do with it what you will. Now that's enough about that lovely goofy code name. Let's talk about Ubuntu 1910 and what we're dealing with here. Here's all the release dates and the freezing dates and all that stuff, which is really only interesting to people who are into development. I think the most important thing we can take away from here is that the final freeze is happening on October the 10th, which means that whatever we've done to it so far is all we're going to do, and from this point forward, we're just going to fix the bugs as we learn about them. New features and planned changes. Couple of things to talk about. First of all, NVIDIA drivers are now on the actual ISO image that you download and put onto install media, whether you're making a USB stick or you're going old school and doing a DVD. This means that you can install this without an internet connection, and if you have an NVIDIA card, it's going to give you the option by clicking on those third-party things at the install to go ahead and install those drivers. And that means on the first boot that you will have the native NVIDIA proprietary drivers. The way it's worked in the past is, before they added this feature at all, you would install Ubuntu, boot it up, do your updates, and then you would go into the additional drivers and you would install the drivers and you'd reboot the system yet again and it was kind of a little bit of a pain and it was a stumbling block for people so now they're just including it they're saying here it is bang there you go in the last couple of releases they have had it where i think it was downloading those drivers at install which could take some time if you were on a slow internet connection so they just decided to stick them on the disk ZFS, that is a file system and volume manager in one, and that is very interesting to people who are into servers and big storage arrays. Uh, it's kind of like uh, ButterFS, which is a native Linux file system that does pretty much the same thing, except ZFS is generally considered to be more stable, and it has been used with uh, BSD Unix, there has been some licensing licensing problems. Yeah, licensing. I can say that word, see? 
that's been the issue that's kind of held it from being native to the system. I think if you wanted to use this before, that you would have to build your own kernel modules and stuff like that, and that could be a bit problematic. Now it's it's baked in. However, for the desktop user and the regular laptop user, it really doesn't matter. Good old ext4, which is the standard file system that ships with Ubuntu, is perfectly all right and actually recommended for that particular application. Now we're not talking about a file system with you know your directories and where things are stored. We're talking about the actual format that the data is put onto the storage device with ext4 or zfs. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So what else is there to talk about? Well, we get GNOME 3.34 and there's the list of features and that's when it's not included you can click on the link and you can figure this out for yourself i'm not going to read it to you i just wanted to kind of glance over the important stuff here now let's get into actually looking at the system welcome to ubuntu's eowyn ermine this is what it looks like the little cartoon ermine is staring at me he kind of freaks me out a little bit so at some point we might want to change the wallpaper so this is what the canonical spin of the GNOME desktop looks like. Starting from left to right, we have a custom dock, which acts a whole lot like the Dash in Unity used to act. Well, they didn't call that the Dash, did they? They called that the Launcher in Unity. They kind of act pretty much the same way. So if you're used to using that, then you're not going to have a problem with this. One of the things about the way Ubuntu does their mainline release is they don't change how it works very much from release to release. And the idea is, uh, if this is in an enterprise setting where they have administrators that have trained people how to use the system, they don't have to go back and retrain them. That's the whole point. So you're not going to see any huge changes in how the system works. and pretty much looks the same as it did when they first switched to GNOME from Unity a couple of years ago. So if you're currently using Ubuntu 18.04 with the GNOME desktop on it, you're probably noticing that these look a little bit different. That is because the GNOME project ditched the active desktop. They made this so it wasn't supposed to be an active desktop. However, the Canonical folks have installed a plugin that makes it work somewhat like an active desktop. Yes, you can create a file here. You can you can do some, let's see, it's, can we, we can, no, we can make a new folder. So we can't create a new file. Let's give it a name. I don't know. We'll just call it uh, junk. That's the one I usually name my new folders. So it creates a new folder here, but we can't create a file here. We've lost a lot of the uh, functionality that we had when it was a native active desktop in the GNOME desktop. And by the way, that is handled by the file manager itself, which is called Nautilus and Nautilus no longer has that feature. It's a trend in the GNOME world that the desktop developers, if they run across a feature that they find problematic or they don't like the code or they don't want to deal with, they just make it go poof. It's like, oh, well, you don't need that anymore anyway. Goodbye. I mean, they did that with the little icons up here. They've done that with, um, I think they're planning to do that with this little feature right here. This might be a plug-in running now. I'm not really sure. No, I think this is native. I'm don't, let's not get ahead of myself on that one. But they, they want to, this is this little box that uh, shows up on the panel when you open some sort of uh, application. And they're talking about getting rid of that as well. So anyway, for us GNOME users, and I have been a GNOME user for quite some time, off and on through the years, it, it, it's a little bit frustrating. I actually really like using the GNOME desktop and I have a problem switching over to anything else. I mean, I can use stuff for about a week and then I start missing it. And it's like, no, I'm going back to GNOME. And so that's just the way it is, gang. Okay, let's talk about memory consumption. We got a lot of little things to cover. Try not to make mistakes typing in simple things. Makes you look like an idiot. Okay, so what we have here is HTOP running, and it's telling us right now that we're using almost a gig, 952 megabytes. When you first boot this up, it's about 700 megabytes being used by the desktop. And that's actually an improvement because in the past, 
it, it's been as much as a gig with the GNOME desktop. So the GNOME desktop, generally speaking, is not for hardware that doesn't have a great deal of memory or runs short on resources. You probably want to have a pretty hefty machine. But as time has gone on, it's definitely gotten better, especially since uh, Canonical has kind of been shaving down how much memory it sucks up. Now, you're seeing that one because I've actually played around in here doing previous takes of this video, and every time you open something, it, it adds to the memory because it, stay, it stays in memory. So, like I said, we're not going to have any huge changes other than theming in here. I can tell you that this is very zippy. This is running in a virtual machine, and by the way, we're running it in GNOME boxes this time around and not VirtualBox. I have switched over from VirtualBox. I had mentioned that in the video about Ubuntu Mate, but I decided uh, that I, got, I just got tired of dealing with the problems that I was having with the uh, VirtualBox program of things running very slow. And a lot of people had said, hey, you really need to try GNOME Boxes. And I was like, no, I have tried GNOME Boxes. I don't like it. And they said, no, it's changed. So I went and looked up actually how to install it and looked up the directions on how to do it and I have put it in the system and it's pretty zippy. Now if you're seeing any screen artifacts that's probably because this is running in a virtual machine and we're capturing the video. Sometimes that gives a little screen tearing. I'm not seeing too much of it when I'm looking at it here anyway. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the, the complete tour. We'll talk a little bit about the applications that have they ship with. One of the big things is I was kind of happy to see that Thunderbird is the default mail client. You may recall if you did see the video where I talked about Ubuntu Mate that I was kind of bemoaning the fact that they had switched over to Evolution. Well that seems to be something that that team has done for that flavor. That is not happening across the board with Ubuntu. This ships with Thunderbird. Thunderbird is my mail client of choice. I have a lot of accounts to deal with, especially since I host my own accounts uh, for the easylinux.com page and that sort of thing. And so I need a mail client. I know that most average people these days, they're happy with using Gmail in a browser. I never can do that. I really like to have a mail client and I'm glad they're sticking with Thunderbird on mainline Ubuntu because that's just one more thing that I don't have to change if I should decide to upgrade uh, to this, which I'm probably not going to do because it's an interim release. But when uh, 2004 comes along, the next one, uh, that's something I'll definitely be thinking about. We get Rhythmbox for the music player. It works great. We have the software application. It's called, uh, I think they call it Ubuntu software, but this is uh, uh, GNOME software, which is uh, something that ships on anything with the GNOME desktop these days. If, so if you're running Fedora or whatever, I think this application is available to you as well. They've done a lot of tweaking in here. This has gotten better and better over time. It's, it's actually pretty reliable. Uh, you don't have to install a, a deb package installer if you don't want to. You can click double click on a deb package and it will do it through here. It does a pretty decent job. I really can't complain about the software application. It is okay. Now this Amazon link right here, what is this and what does it mean? Well, if you click on that, it's going to open up Amazon.com. And if you log in with your Amazon account and you buy something, that means that Canonical gets a little kickback. It's a way to donate to the Ubuntu project and make sure that they are well funded. Because do keep in mind, even though Canonical is a company that is for profit, Ubuntu itself is a separate entity which is open sourced and it is largely funded through contributions and donations. So that's something that people need to keep in mind. They have to have that revenue stream if they're going to be giving it away for free, which is what they do. So there you go. Uh, I don't know if there's a whole lot else to talk about here. This is just every and that's one of the things I kind of don't like about boxes. Every time I put the cursor up here, that little bar pops down, but hey, thus far it's faster than VirtualBox, so I'm not going to complain. VirtualBox on my computer, somebody asked before, is it just uh, on Linux? I don't know whether it has to do with it being the Linux version or not, but I do know on this machine that it crawls. It is so slow. And the host machine that I'm recording this on has 32 gigabytes of hardened ECC RAM and twin Xeon processors. This thing is no slouch, ladies and gentlemen, but yet it would run just horribly slow. I mean, you can see that in some of my videos. This is way zippier. 
uh, running GNOME boxes, although I have managed to crash it several times. So a couple of issues to talk about before we wrap up this video. Like I said, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but there are a couple of things to talk about. First of all, uh, we need to talk a little bit about an issue that you may run into where um, you hear pops and clicks in the sound, especially like just before a system sound plays or you play a video, you'll click on the video, you'll hear a click, and then the video will play, and about five seconds later, you'll hear another click. That is because the developers of Ubuntu have enabled this little thing that works with some sound cards that lets you turn them off when they're not in use. This is a power saving thing. The problem is, is that with a lot of sound cards, especially the one that's built into my Dell machine here, what happens is, is that you hear these pops and clicks all the time. And I have my sound routed into a couple of pretty big speakers. I have a pretty big self-powered speaker set here and it makes a pretty loud pop. So it's quite annoying. So I found a way to fix that and I'm going to put instructions on how to do that into the description for the video. Now, this is new since the last time we talked about Ubuntu 1910. The, the canonical developers want you to use snap packages. We have covered snap packages in the past, but let's talk a little bit about what a snap package is. So if I run ls block, which shows me my storage devices, let me make this a little bit bigger here, scale this uh, terminal up. By the way, I really like the fact that this is a terminal that is themed in such a way that I don't feel the need to automatically jump into the preferences and change it. For the last few releases with the GNOME desktop, Ubuntu has had the terminal with that damn menu bar popping up. I don't like that. I don't need that crap. This is sleek. So I wouldn't make major changes to this other than getting rid of the scroll bar, which I don't like. So kudos to whoever decided to ship without the menu bar activated. Anyway, I like the new color scheme as well. So what you're looking at here are all of the storage devices that are attached to the system. A snap package is another way of getting software onto your Linux system. And you can run snaps on any distribution of Linux, which is really kind of cool. So it's cross-platform, right? The way it works is that you have this big package that has all the dependencies for the piece of software in there and it gets installed and then it runs in what is known as a sandbox which are these little loop file systems here that are attached to the system so these are all the snaps that are in here already snaps are cool but snaps do have some issues in the past there's been theming problems font rendering problems stuff like that so like you would install something on a snap and you have your font scaling set for a certain way to look good and then the snap doesn't match up to that and it don't look right and it doesn't have the theme and then you have some problems with the fact that it is running in a sandbox which keeps it nice and secure but it also means that it can't see certain directories on the file system without certain permissions and sometimes that causes problems in other words this is not a perfect setup snaps are really great on servers they're great for terminal applications they're wonderful for small things great big huge graphic applications are a problem. And I told you all of that to tell you this. The canonical developers have decided that now when you install the Chromium browser, which we're going to attempt to do by running the commands we're all used to, uh, oh, I see. All right. What you should see now is that this goes and downloads a deb package, right? That's what you're used to. So it's sudo apt install and it goes and gets the deb package and installs the Chromium browser. Watch what happens. We're going to install what they're calling a transitional package. So you notice here that it's installing and then it's switched over to the snap installer. That is because Canonical wants to distribute some software, especially like the Chromium browser in a snap because it's easier for them. Right now for web browsers and things like that that change a lot, they get a lot of updates. What happens is, is that they have to prepare four packages 
at any given time. And those are the versions of Ubuntu that are currently being supported. If they do a snap, it's one package and it works cross-platform. So this has caused a little controversy. Some people are happy about this and some people are not. And there's a kind of a debate that's going on, or at least it's starting to. You need to be aware of this if you are a Chromium user and you are going to be doing um, this in Ubuntu, is that it's going to install this snap. And you're noticing that it's taking its sweet time to do this <laughs> uh, because the snap package is going to be, I believe it's larger than the regular dev package because all of the dependencies are included. So uh, that, that is, that's going on. This is something that's happening uh, in Ubuntu and they have plans to backport this to all the current supported versions. So if you've been getting the Chrome or Chromium browser from uh, a dev package, uh, at some point they're going to switch you over to a snap. Now I'm not exactly sure how they're going to do that, but that's what they plan to do. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to let this install and we'll see what it looks like and we'll, we'll open it and all that stuff. All right, it says it's done. And no, we don't want to search the history. It's what happens when the uh, control R opens up the history search application in the terminal and runs your screen recorder at the same time. So it installed, but it actually took it a little while. I don't know what was going on. It was acting like it couldn't get to the internet to download the snap package. So let's see if we can give that a, a quick spin and see what it looks like. So let's go here and I'll just type in Chrome searching. That's not finding that. Or maybe it did, I don't know, or maybe I typed that in wrong. I have want to do that. Let's go in here and take a look and see if we can find... Oh, there it is. It, so it's showing up there, but it's not finding it in the search. We'll look at that again after I open it up. Maybe that's what it needs. So I clicked on it, so let's see what we get. So it's opening the Chromium Snap package. Uh, it's taking its time to load, that's for sure. That's another thing I have found with snaps is that sometimes they run a little bit slower than they ought to. It seems to be following the GTK theme, so that in and of itself is good. Uh, it does not appear to have... Let's see here. Let's go over here. Uh, no, I don't know whether it's following the font scaling or not. But that can be an issue with Thunderbird, or rather with um, Chromium and Chrome as it is. So that's what it looks like running from a snap. And I'm curious to see. So there's our Chromium snap right there. Now one of the things that happens with snap packages is, is that you, you might look at LS block and you'll notice that you'll have more than one version. It actually rolls them. I think the last two versions are available so you can roll back if there's a problem. Updating snaps happens automatically like once every like four times a day I think is what it uh, it it's supposed to do and it goes out and does all that in the background and you don't have anything to do with it. So that's the snap system and the fact now that Chromium will be coming as a snap in future versions of Ubuntu. Don't quite know how to feel about that myself, but we did show you how it worked and actually pulled it off. <laughs> Almost forgot. Let's see what happens when I try and search for Chrome again. C-H-R-O-M-E. Yeah, I found it that time. Well, no, and for some reason, uh, look at that. Ah, okay, it's because it starts with an I. That's the thing. I put in Chrome before. Wanted to make sure that it wasn't me or that there was some, not something wrong with the system on that, because somebody would jump in the comments and go, what the, why didn't that work? What happened? I don't understand. I'm confused. So there you go, gang. It's a look around. Very brief. It's the same Ubuntu that we've had for quite some time, since like Ubuntu 1704 or something like that, when they first switched over to GNOME. It's just incremental improvements. Uh, it seems to be working very well. Very peppy. I haven't tried the GNOME version on hardware, but I did run the Mate version for on hardware for a week. I can tell you that it's stable. I can tell you that it's very fast. And other than the sound issue and uh, 
an issue that I had with NVIDIA graphics that goes along with Ubuntu Mate, I don't have any issues. So let me know what happens if you decide to download and install the beta for yourself. It's always fun to play with these things and give the feedback to the canonical developers if you can because it really helps them to make a better product and since so much is based on Ubuntu uh, it's kind of important to the entire Linux ecosystem so there you go oh it rotated on me man do you see that in case you're wondering why this keeps happening it's because of the fact that all of a sudden now this uh <laughs> hold on we're gonna fix it okay so i've been making videos forever now that all that garbage you just saw <laughs> this is the first time this has ever happened i like to put up this uh this slide right and then i can full screen it like i do and then I can use Control R to turn the voice, uh, the the recorder back on. And what happened is, is that it went completely crazy on me. So if you're wondering what that was all about, it's that that is obviously a shortcut that goes along with this image viewer. And what it does is it rotates the image. See, it's never happened before. That's a first. So I got to keep that in mind. Uh, figure a way around that maybe anyway your feedback is always welcome thank you so much for watching this I'm gonna leave that in because I bet you it looks really cool and I probably sound like a complete idiot and uh, you can laugh at that if you want to check out easy Linux on the web at easylinux.com that's where everything comes together check out easy talk which is our forum that's free secure and fun and be sure to check out easy Linux on Facebook if you're a Facebook user Give it a like if you would. It helps. We have a lot of great discussion going on, both in the forum and on Facebook. So whichever one works out best for you, I hope to see you there. So thank you for watching. We'll do it again soon.